All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this bonus lecture on the well-being state. We're talking about metamodernity. I've got my beer. It's Friday night. I've got some dessert, a couple of chalky wafer sticks. I'm ready to talk about deep and meaningful stuff. Uh, everything in this lecture is like totally beyond uh, the sort of core of the course, so I wouldn't expect you guys to refer to this in any way, shape, or form in your assessments. Um, and it's really just mostly for my own amusement, really, that I'm putting it in uh, as some bonus material. But a few people, particularly in the, the first seminar on Monday, seem to be kind of interested in this meta modernity stuff. And I also felt like I just hadn't really finished the sort of response to the cultural issues that I raised in the first part of the Wellbeing State lectures. So I thought I'd talk about this a little bit. This is really kind of responding to the issue of nihilism uh, and how we solve nihilism at the social level, so not at the individual level. Um, solving it at the individual level, I'd really have to give quite a long lecture on that, um, but I have written on it, so if someone's interested in that question, they should please uh, email me and I'll happily forge you the materials. Um, all right, well, let's get into it. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. All right, here we go, here we go. All right, so what is this lecture about? So it's basically about solutions to nihilism. So in the first well-being lecture, well-being state lecture, sorry, I talked a lot about nihilism um, and then I built up to political economy issues in what's going wrong with our, our society and culture at the moment. But I never really went turned to, never really went back to those cultural issues. So uh, I think I had one slide on them and I wanted to give them a more thorough treatment. And I'd be very interested in kind of your reactions to these themes because this is stuff that I'm I'm still very much working on um, in in my research. And the basic idea is that if uh, a lot of the fundamental issues that we face today, like polarization, like excessive materialism, etc., are a function of cultural issues, not a function so much of policy issues, then it's not really sufficient for us to talk about policy solutions. We need to talk about cultural solutions, and a lot of those aren't going to involve the government or the state or policy in any way. And I think that's particularly the case with the solution that I'm going to propose to you today, uh, which is metamodernity. And metamodernity isn't even really like a lever that we pull. I believe it is the emerging cultural mode. It's what comes after postmodernism, uh, and it's broadly kind of how our society is trying to work its way through the nihilism that comes after postmodernism. I think this little cartoon I have here at the bottom um, from XKCD is a pretty good entry point into metamodernity. Metamodernity is more than that, but this kind of gets at the basic idea of intrinsic motivation, interest, curiosity, and sincerity and earnestness as being really fundamental to how we start to move beyond um, moral relativism and uh, existential vacuum. If you don't know what those words mean, uh, please go and read the Frankel reading um, from the First Wellbeing State uh, week. All right. So in order to understand what metamodernity is, we have to briefly talk about modernism and postmodernism. So modernism is a very long thing, kind of really starts more in like the late 17th century. But modernism for our purposes, sometimes referred to as high modernism, is the era, I'm sorry, the era immediately after World War II. So it is the kind of the high tide of the welfare state, particularly in Europe. Um, and it's characterized by humanist idealism. So this real kind of, uh, uh, kind of extreme faith in rationalism and reason. So you can imagine that after World War II, where we'd solved all these technological problems, notably we had split the atom, which was a pretty big deal. Uh, there was a lot of optimism among kind of intellectual communities that uh, as long as we were able to marry this kind of scientific power that we were developing, this control over the natural world, to what could be called humanist values, so the idea that um, rather than seeking to kind of impose various religious doctrines on people or various kind of traditional orders, what we should be trying to promote is, is uh, human development, human rights, these kind of ideas. As long as if we could bring these two things together, 
humanism and uh, science, then we could sort of create a better world. It was a really nice, like, good vibes kind of story. And uh, I guess one of the main legacies of humanism is these massive social housing projects across Europe, which nowadays, you know, underwhelm in many ways, but at the time would have been really quite inspiring. So the Barbican is, is an example of this social infrastructure the rationalism of it was that we tried to sort of calculate what a person needed or what a family needed in terms of a reasonable amount of space, like how big did the bedrooms be and the kitchens and the balconies and stuff, and then you just sort of mass produce apartments that meet those specifications using new techniques with concrete manufacturing and stuff like that, and you build into these big housing developments churches, community centres, gardens, green spaces, etc., And I think the Barbican is a really nice example of that. The Barbican, of course, being in London, for those who haven't visited, it's well worth uh, just taking a walk around. All right, so modernism kind of terminates in postmodernism. So postmodernism begins from sort of the 1970s onwards and really has its high tide um, in the 1990s. Uh, And really good pop culture manifestation of the postmodern period is, I think, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I've got an image from here. And what I really want you to draw your attention to in this poster from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is the pastiche. So just how there is kind of no, like, coherence to what people are wearing. It's almost, like, deliberately ugly what people are wearing, like browns and pastels and fluoro um, and just, like, a weird mashup of all sorts of different stuff because postmodernism was a time when people just kind of lost all contact with sort of objective or notions of there being such a thing as beauty or such a thing as the good or the right and these kind of things. And so people just kind of charged headlong into this feeling that nothing really mattered, nothing really made sense, and that kind of manifested in their clothing. Now, what were the kind of intellectual origins of that kind of um, cultural mode Um, So the three big thinkers in this, they're all French, um, were probably, arguably, uh, Lyotard. So Lyotard kind of advanced this idea of incredulity towards meta-narratives. So the postmodern period um, isn't following these thinkers. These thinkers are trying to distill the key features of postmodernism. So one of the key features of postmodernism was that the public in general became very incredulous towards meta-narratives. So incredulity is scepticism, is is cynicism, is not believing it. And a meta-narrative is a kind of grand story that sort of explains all of history and where humanity is going. So a classic example of that is Marxism. Um, Marxism has this kind of dialectical materialism built into it that whoever controls the means of production sets the order of society, and that tr- in the past that was uh, the landowners, and then they were overthrown by the merchant class, and eventually the proletariat will overthrow the merchant class and shepherd in um, communism. So there was general scepticism towards these kind of big narratives. There was uh, the sense that there was no kind of overarching story to the world or society or history or anything like that. Then you get Foucault, and I think he's probably the most influential uh, postmodern thinker, and I would summarise his kind of insights, or at least the thing that he distilled really well, as the notion that expertise is really just a cover for the value judgments of people with power. And I think one of his best examples of that, um, drawn from um, The Asylum, I think the book is called, Um, is the idea that homosexuality was for a very long time considered a psychiatric disorder rather than a kind of naturally occurring phenomenon. And that really just represents the kind of cultural prejudices of the the kind of elite classes who were able to afford to train as psychoanalysts um, and their kind of Catholic biases and these kind of things that saw homosexuality as very problematic. And once you start to see that a lot of the value judgments that we kind of take for granted in society, particularly those that we see as coming from authority figures, figures who have power because they are wise or intelligent or educated or whatever it might be, um, if these uh, authority figures turn out to have kind of no clothes, as it were, then uh, we start to become very sceptical of all value judgments and we start to think that everything's just a power grab 
and nothing's really true when it comes to value judgments. Related to that, you had um, Derrida in the kind of cultural space, particularly the art world, arguing that all meaning is socially constructed and engaging in this very uh, elaborate, slightly wanky, I would say pretentious um, process of deconstructing the meaning of texts um, and showing that really meaning is a very elusive thing and is only sustained intersubjectively. So things only mean things because we agree on their meaning and that meaning is always contested and always being constantly reconstructed. And a very important element of that idea comes out of Judith Butler's work on gender, from Gender Trouble, which is this idea that kind of gender, one of the most uh, fundamental categories in uh, human society historically, is really quite performative, uh, and the particular tropes of masculine and feminine, while they have uh, certainly some uh, kind of biological basis, uh, are, are very um, socially constructed. So just to give you a sense for the biological basis, for example, um, like if you have very high levels of testosterone, you will tend to be more aggressive than the average individual. Um, and then men have, on average, more testosterone, um, and so masculine behavior tends to be slightly more aggressive, or we associate that kind of ag aggressivity with the masculine. Um, so it's, it's uh, a little bit complicated to say exactly what is socially constructed and what is uh, kind of biological, what is gender, what is sex. If you're interested in a, a kind of psych uh, scientific treatment of that issue, then I think Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate from the late 2000s is really quite an excellent book, um, but I won't, I won't get into it in this lecture. So the kind of takeaway from postmodernism is that people really start to feel that value and meaning is just made up. It's just relative. Um, there's no sense in which value and meaning is written into the bedrock of the universe. It's something that we as value-creating subjects bring to the universe. Uh, and that, if you recall from the first well-being lecture, is really kind of where nihilism begins. This idea that, well, if it's just made up, then it's not true. And then, you know, why should I do anything? What, what is the right thing to do if it's really just my own opinion that I'm doing things for? Now, that kind of nihilist tide was held at bay post-World War II um, and still to this day in, in, I think, a lot of the world and a lot of communities by materialist values. So after World War II, everything was really bleak but we had all these new technologies and things and we had to rebuild the world. And there was a sense that we just had to kind of get on with it and we could get wealthy. Everyone could have a car and a house, and good wages and a good life. It was just knuckle down and do work. Um, and that really sustained us quite well until about the 1990s when we started to get a little bit more, uh, some tremors through that materialism, even in America. And then I think particularly after the global financial crisis, um, which put materialism out of reach for a lot of people, um, especially in countries that um, acted with austerity afterwards, uh, materialism has started to become questions, particularly much more by the younger generation. And the younger generation is also very concerned about the impact that materialist values is having on the environment. And so they're not particularly interested in pursuing a system of meaning and value that is based in consumption and exploitation of the environment. So materialism is kind of played out and so this vacuum is just getting bigger. Like we need to fill it with some kind of new values. All right, so the question then becomes, well, what cultural mode, what uh, kind of structure of feeling across the wider society comes after modernism and postmodernism? And the answer that a few scholars have proposed, um, particularly um, Timothy Vermeulen and Robin Vandenacker, who are two uh, Dutch uh, Dutch cultural theorists, they propose this idea of metamodernism. And I've got this uh, image from Shia LaBeouf here because Shia LaBeouf is uh, quite well known for producing a lot of metamodern art. And this video about just do it is one example of that, that, um, that style of metamodern art. So what, what are the defining characteristics of metamodernism? Um, well, I'll go through it over a few slides, but I think the first one is that it begins from an acknowledgement of postmodernism. So it does not pretend like Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris or some other characters that there is, in fact, a kind of objective moral order. I shouldn't say pretend. There might be an objective moral order. Certainly, if you're religious, that's how you think about things. Um, but uh, even if it does exist, it's very hard for us to prove it. So you have to kind of acknowledge that there is no firm 
rational objectivist basis for us to organize society around any particular values or meanings. If you happen to have faith in a certain doctrine, that's great. Um, but it's, there's few grounds within a liberal democratic uh, political economy for you to impose those values on anybody else. And so we remain in this kind of cultural quagmire about what values to organize our society around. So it begins with an acknowledgement of that postmodern tenant, but it also recognizes from modernism that people want to feel meaning and value in their lives, that that's really quite crucial to human well-being, crucial to healthy human psychological functioning, and that people want to be able to feel that meaning and value and practice it with other people. So humans are a very social species. Culture is fundamental to us, and culture is something that we can only do collectively. So metamodernity recognizes this lack of um, objective moral values and meanings, but nonetheless recognizes that we want to sort of act as though they are objective, or at least we want to feel them palpably in our lives. So how do we then generate this feeling that we are in real palpable systems of meaning and value, that these meanings and values are true? Um, how do we generate that feeling if they are not in fact true or if there's no way for us to prove convincingly that they are true? And the answer that seems to be emerging in metamodernity is through seriousness and earnestness. All right, so if you care about something, which means that you just have an intrinsic motivation to it, it's not something that you really need to justify. If, if most of us, if we reflect uh, on what we'd like to do with our time or what things we just seem to care about, without any uh, sort of need to justify it, we'll be able to come up with some things. So I, for example, just really like rock climbing. I don't really need to think about why I like it. I just enjoy doing it, so I'm just going to go and do it. And I also really like teaching, so that's why I'm giving a lecture on Friday night. Um, so all of us have these kind of intrinsic motivations, and we just put these intrinsic motivations, these things that we value, out into the world. We just say to people, hey, I think this is really cool. I'm going to go and do it. If you think it's cool, you should join me and we should do it together. And so communities form around these spontaneous individual expressions of value and those communities then start to form systems of meaning and value and attendant cultures that intersubjectively sustain those systems. All right, I want to start by giving you an example of metamodernity in practice. So I'm not going to read through this comic. I just uh, want you to pause the video and read it through. All right, so Dream Girl, this comic, which is an XKCD comic, is a very clear articulation of nihilist sentiment, right? So there's this world, it's dying, it's falling apart, all its values and meanings, those systems that hold it together, are being shredded. That's what you see in the top right-hand corner. People want out of that nihilism, that's what you see in the bottom part, but there's no way out of it because nihilism is true. That's the postmodern sentiment. It turns out that wanting something doesn't make it real. But when this comic came out, this XKCD comic, a bunch of people without any organization whatsoever, so there was no one saying, hey, let's do this and setting up a website for it or whatever, a bunch of completely disparate, isolated people all had the same idea to turn up at these coordinates in the real world at this time and day and get together to celebrate their love of XKCD. And so we had this incredible metamodern event, the XKCD meetup, where a bunch of people who just sincerely and earnestly love this series of comics got together at these coordinates at this park in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I believe, um, brought their costumes to dress up as XKCD characters, a guy brought his trebuchet, um, people celebrated all their various ways in which they love XKCD. So this is a super earnest event, a super sincere event. It's a bunch of individuals spontaneously expressing their values and a community forms around that spontaneous expression of value. And then that community makes those values and meanings feel palpable, feel like they really are valuable. These things really do mean something because when I talk about the trebuchet or the veloc velociraptor, or a citation needed, or whatever it might be, there are all these other people around me who understand the meaning that I'm trying to convey. And so through this, we are able to transcend the kind of nihilism of, of postmodernism. 
Another example um, is the fighting game community. So fighting games originate in the kind of early 80s with Street Fighter, which is about to enter its sixth edition. Um, the fighting game community is a bunch of people who just really like fighting games. Originally, they used to congregate in arcades. Now they spend mostly uh, time gaming over the internet, but there are nonetheless still places in all major cities, um, including London, where you can get together in various bars that have arcade machines and play these games. And the game um, community organizes various tournaments and has various international leagues. They have these events like this one that I've got a photo of here, the uh, Evo Championships, where tens of thousands of people who really like fighting games get together for a week to just participate in a massive festival of fighting games. And the community that forms in these kind of cases then develops all the tropes of culture. So they develop rituals, they develop customs, they develop specific languages, hierarchies, all sorts of um, curios like that. And again, the fact that everyone participates in these things together and they take on an organic life of their own makes them feel like the systems of meaning and value that are inherent to these communities are real and palpable and true. And they bring meaning to people's lives and through that they can overcome nihilism. I think basically if you want to see other examples of this stuff, you should just go on Reddit and look at their niche sub-communities. An example would be the zero waste community. All right. Now, a very interesting aspect of meta modernity for me as someone who um, came out of uh, moral philosophy and political theory is the way culture is policed in meta modernity. So in traditional human society, people are socialized into particular values from birth. Uh, I think the clearest case uh, for that would be like very orthodox communities in society today. So I live in the middle of the Haredi community, the Haredi Jewish Orthodox community in London. Um, and it's very clear that from a very, very young age, children are socialized into the values, customs, practices, rituals, etc., of that community. Um, now, arguably, that's uh, not the most liberal basis for a very intense culture. Um but you get things like the Mormons, where everyone is encouraged to leave. Sorry, not the Mormons, the uh, the Amish, where everyone is encouraged to leave the community for six months or 12 months when they turn 18. And if they like the outside world better, they can continue with the outside world or they can come back into the Amish community, but then they've got to stay in the Amish community. In any case, you're socialized into something from birth. There's a very thick culture. So the norms are very tightly uh, prescribed and tightly policed. So if you deviate from the norms, your community will really check you quite hard. There will be very substantial social sanctions for deviating from norms. Under meta-modernity, we instead see people uh, organizing and associating and forming communities by free association, right? And then they agree on the rules of those communities in very kind of uh, haphazard organic ways rather than through very long, old, established hierarchies like the Jewish priesthood. Um, and as a result of that, there's a much more uh, liberal foundation to community and a different attitude to policing its boundaries because the boundaries of the community are, like all value judgments in meta-modernity, arbitrary. So you can't really say on the margin that someone's behavior is not in line with the particular practices of the group um, and therefore check them. So behavior tends to be policed much more gently and in a much more discursive way than what we see in traditional cultures. I think an interesting example of this for anyone who's been following it is the ructions in the effective altruism community following uh, the discovery that Sam Bankman-Fried, who was their main financier, uh, was engaged in massive amounts of fraud. Um, and now the community is kind of wondering whether they're in fact not so moral and they're just maybe super arrogant. And there's quite a lively debate within the community about how to proceed on that basis. Um, yeah, so the key thing here is that we're not oppressing differences across within groups quite as much as we used to, and certainly not across groups. So humans have always had culture to help us cooperate in groups. That was often so that we could wage war effectively with other groups. Now we're not really interested in that warfare. We're mostly just interested in helping ourselves feel um, palpable meaning and value. I should say that I'm... Um, showing examples uh, in a lot of this imagery from popular culture that I think is very metamodern. So I think I mentioned in one of the lectures as well that I think the new 
uh, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power is like totally amazing generally as a kid's show and as an adult's show um, and is uh, a really good example of a lot of these metamodern tropes. Um, another example of a contemporary piece of pop culture that is extremely metamodern is uh, the Harley Quinn animated series, which is a real kind of like subversion of a lot of the conventional tropes of Batman and of Harley Quinn. And one of the most striking uh, events in that show at the end of season three is that Batman goes to therapy. So instead of taking out his childhood traumas on criminals by beating them in the face, he instead goes to get some therapy. And this brings me to one of the main themes I think is the case in Men and Modernity, which is healing, not coping. So here's kind of how I see this. Post-World War II, everyone was full of trauma, millions of people dead, pretty much everyone had someone close to them who died. And so you had to kind of get on with it post that trauma. There was so much trauma and we didn't understand mental health at all. So we couldn't really go about healing from that trauma. The main way to heal was to rebuild. So we kind of suppressed a lot of that trauma and just got on with building stuff. And arguably that uh, silence generation and then the boomers who followed them afterwards are a bit emotionally repressed and tend to get on with things and focus on work rather than getting through, sorry, rather than doing the work of, of healing and getting, getting therapy. Now, as I outlined in the first Wellbeing State lecture, life's pretty good these days. We've got heaps of GDP, health, education, all the rest of it. So what are we getting on with it for? Where are we trying to get to? The point is that eventually we have to get so rich that now it is time to step back and work on our issues and try to heal from our trauma. And so I think we are now seeing, um, particularly in the very young generation, so the, the millennials, the zillennials, and then the whatever comes after the zillennials, Gen Z, Zoomers, um, really having this attitude that they're not going to put up with nonsense and like you should take care of yourself and it's okay to be a mess it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to like get back on the wagon and get back to work. You can just take time out and take as long as you need to get yourself together in whatever way you then feel comfortable with. And so I think uh, uh, an additional aspect of this is that a lot of things associated with woke culture, particularly around identity and being yourself, um, rather than suppressing your particular individuality so that the group can get on with being a functional group, um, we're really seeing a lot of generational change there. People are encouraged to explore their particular identities and get comfortable with who they are and then participate in society on that basis. All right. Another trope of men and modern modernity that I see is a, is a, a lot more um, investment or time for or whatever emotion and intuition rather than reason. Metamodern culture, as I said, is really founded on intrinsic motivation, sincerity, and earnestness, the kind of thing you see in cosplay communities, huge dork behavior, but you love it. You're just doing it anyway. You don't care what people think of your behavior there. And now people are really starting to celebrate cosplay and think it's super cool. Now, these things, motivation, sincerity, and earnestness, they're not rational. And they can't be rational because as postmodernism has demonstrated, rationalism is just a super flimsy foundation for dealing with nihilism. We can only deal with nihilism through these more emotional foundations. Because of that, reason has to take a little bit of a backseat under metamodernity um, and allow all these other cultural forces to really take the wheel, cultural forces like language, tropes, ritual, etc., now, this then relates to another extremely important and I think increasingly prominent theme of metamodernity, which is this notion of be kind uh, and the importance of empathy. Um, and to give you a sense for how this manifests in uh, contemporary youth culture, I want you to pause the video now and go to this YouTube link that I've got here, which will take you to um, a scene from the remake of 21 Jump Street that I think really captures this quite nicely. So I'll uh, wait one second. Okay. So the basic idea um, that I'm sort of getting at when I talk about be kind and empathy is that sincerity and earnestness are very vulnerable things. Like when you just put your values out there with no really strong foundation, just saying, look, I think this is super cool. Like I love collecting 
Barbie dolls or whatever it might be. Like I love getting super insanely into macrame and indoor gardening and I'm all about cottage core or I just like to be really, really super duper buff. Whatever it might be that you're heaps into, when you put yourself out there into the world so earnestly, you're really setting yourself up to get smacked down by some bully as, as uh, Channing Tatum displays in this clip and that's what things used to be like in the 90s. Um, but nowadays, I think there's much more of a kind of willingness to just kind of celebrate people when they put their values out there, regardless of what those values might be, unless they're, you know, extremely problematic. Um, and generally, there's much more of a, a kind of uh, beyond tolerance attitude, like active empathy. And I think part of that empathy is recognizing that all normative communities are made up of people trying to deal with the human condition, which is being a value creating agent in their own way. So younger generations of religious people are generally much more open to the way secular people go about their lives, and I think vice versa. The people who are really left outside are the kind of religious fundamentalists. They're having a very bad time because they're not tolerated because they lack empathy for others, um, and they are also quite intolerant of um, a lot of mainstream society because they still hold that, what they hold very strongly and in a way that... um, is difficult to tolerate uh, tolerate difference from the notion that there are particular things that are true and good and valuable and any deviation from that is evil. It's the devil's work. Um, that's where we see a lot of friction, but I think outside of kind of fundamentalist communities, uh, we're really entering a much more kind of high tolerance period. Um, oh, I should say that this uh, aspect of men and modernity is, I think, very contested at the moment. So, Men and modernity may well descend into a kind of cesspit defined by cancel culture and professional dividers like Chris Rufo, um, or it can become this very empathetic, nice, friendly thing, and I hope it's the latter. All right, a couple more points to make before we close. So there are a lot of cultural commentators out there right now, I think perhaps most prominently Jordan Peterson, and I think he did quite a good job of it until about three, four years ago. Definitely three years ago, he just became completely batshit. uh, And nowadays he is a mess and just an embarrassment to himself. But when he first came onto the scene, I think he was making quite erudite, thoughtful points with respect to the idea that one way to respond to this normative vacuum that we find ourselves in is to recover some of the meaning that is inherent and some of the wisdom that is inherent to the great cultural traditions of humanity. And so he is particularly fond, as you might expect, of the Bible, but also generally of the fairy tale mythology of uh, European countries, of which he's very familiar, and he has written quite a lot of books on it back when he was a professor in the University of Toronto. Um, But I think uh, the key problem with that whole agenda is that while there is a lot of treasure to recover in these traditions, the whole reason why we face an existential vacuum today is because those myths are played out. They're not uh, really able to organize people's lives anymore, and we need some new mythology. And where I think we particularly need new mythology is in how we represent the genders. And so I think there is uh, this very powerful new uh, trope that I see in a lot of contemporary cultural output um, that I call the heroine's journey. Um, And I've posted a podcast that I did with my ex, uh, Maddie, who I'm still good friends with, on the Moodle, where we talk about this to some extent. Um, And I, I won't go into more detail than that, but I think the heroine's journey, and these are some of its uh, best examples, uh, along with Alita Battle Angel on the previous slide, um, often represent masculine and feminine characters in a very um, new and novel way, Uh, and I find that often the female characters are presented or are associated with a lot of tropes of motherhood, but are childless. Um, And I think this to be quite an interesting theme when you think about the idea from the Virgin's journey, which is in things like The Little Mermaid and Cinderella and a lot of classic fairy tales for girls, that the Virgin's job is to kind of heal the world, give birth to the new world. And we see that in in a lot of these new myths. 
But I think more broadly than that, a lot of these new myths uh, just kind of represent a very different dynamic between the genders. Um, I think the new Star Wars films were actually really good on this front. And I think a lot of um, a lot of lads just kind of completely missed the point. Like, this isn't a hero's journey anymore. It's quite a different archetype than the original three Star Wars films. And I think as well, um, Princess Mononoke, which is down in the bottom left-hand corner there, um, the male and female characters in there are, are totally amazing from a, a symbolic point of view. So anyway, if you're interested in this stuff, then please uh, have a listen to that podcast. Okay, I'm going to close with uh, a bit of an extended analysis of Everything Everywhere All at Once, um, which is a pretty recent movie, um, definitely on my top five movies of all time, and uh, almost certainly the most metamodern thing that has been produced yet. And Everything Everywhere All at Once really has all the themes that I've been talking about, nihilism, the end of materialism, intergenerational conflict and confusion, not being able to go back to the old myths, um, healing, not coping, be kind, whatever. I think uh, this film has been incredibly successful despite being fairly low budget and not expected to be a particularly big deal. It's been been immensely successful, won tons of awards, and I think that's because it is tapping into the zeitgeist. So it is giving expression to something in the collective subconscious. Older critics, people who are not uh, kind of of the youth, they just fully don't get it. Like I read a lot of reviews of this movie where the reviewer obviously has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Um, all right, so let's get into it. I highly recommend you watch this film. It's very weird, but it's also very good. And uh, maybe watch it before you listen to the rest of this lecture or listen to this lecture and then it'll help you understand it a bit better. So the basic premise of the show is that there's this uh, Chinese migrant couple or Hong Kong migrant couple in San Francisco who run a laundromat and they have uh, a lot of problems with their taxes um, and so the world's just kind of coming down around them because they're, they're worried that they're going to lose the laundromat and they don't really know what to do. Um, and so there's this sense that materialism is out of reach. They can't achieve worldly success. And the mother in particular, played by Michelle Yao, masterfully um, feels like she's a failure in life. And she's uh, judged to some extent by her father um, and their daughter, who's um, a lesbian in, in the movie, uh, feels very kind of marginalized in this uh, intergenerational culture clash uh, because she's not particularly materialistic and the family doesn't really respect her um, her differences. Um, and Michelle Yeoh, uh, in one scene in the movie, is uh, not fantasizing, but that's an easy enough way to think about it, about being really rich. And I think that really kind of uh, drives home this notion of materialism being out of reach. Now, the, the villain of the film is this uh, this character here, uh, Jobu Tapaki, who is uh, the daughter of Michelle Yao in one universe of the multiverse. And in that particular universe, they have this uh, new technology that allows you to um, kind of apply quantum f forces to uh, be in multiple places at once and think in, in a very broad-minded way. Um, and the mother who kind of has invented this technology really goes too hard on her daughter to get her to become really masterful in it. Um, and this kind of breaks her mind in a way. And she becomes Jobu Tupaki. Jobu Tupaki basically can control uh, all quantum things. So she can be, or they rather, can be everything uh, anywhere all at once uh, across time and space and across all universes. So they're quite a fearsome villain. Um, and I think this is an interesting kind of way of, of presenting tiger parenting in a sense um, or of presenting um, the way the younger generation rebels against um, the pressure to succeed, particularly the pressure to just kind of work your ass off to get high grades and then go work for a consulting firm or something where you also work your ass off to perpetuate a kind of exploitative capitalism um, all for the purpose of being seen as a success and working in a prestigious firm. Um, really, it all just feels kind of empty and that pressure is so intense um, that it's very easy to find yourself a bit broken by the combination of pressure and the emptiness of the goals that you're striving for, particularly if, as in the film, the people who are putting all this pressure on you have really very little regard for your emotional needs. And so Jobu Tupaki 
because they experience everything everywhere all at once um, and can change anything into anything else, really starts to be deeply affected by nihilism because it does seem to them that nothing is tangible, nothing is uh, real, there, there is no kind of value in the universe, there is no meaning, it's all just stuff. And this is uh, symbolically represented in the film through the Everything Bagel, where Joe Butapaki takes all of existence and puts it on a bagel. Um, and there's also this scene where um, Jobu takes uh, Michelle Yeoh's character from her universe and, and they both go to this other universe where um, the conditions for human life to evolve never developed and they're just two rocks having a conversation uh, in that universe and that is also a very kind of deeply nihilistic scene. And the Everything Bagel and kind of restoring Jobu Tupaki's uh, faith in, in kind of life and existence is really the kind of the challenge that the film sets out to solve. Now, there is a bunch of characters from the original universe from which Jobu Tupaki emerges um, who try to kill her, basically, that their whole sort of mission is to find her in the multiverse and hunt her down, um, which is very difficult because she's so, or they are so powerful, um, and I think these guys are, again, a symbolic representation of, of the Jordan Peterson types, the people who would like to go back to what we had before postmodernism. And they have a very violent reaction to values pluralism, and they want to try to oppress it. They want to try to kill it uh, and get back to the old orders that we had that were very heavily policed. The alternative perspective is uh, represented by the father, Waymond Wang, um, which I think is a hilarious uh, name, but I guess Raymond Wang, um, which is that you should just be kind. And so he's really the representation of earnestness and seriousness and he uh, and sincerity, sorry, and he really puts earnestness forward as a psychological strategy against nihilism. And so I quote here on the right-hand side, when I choose to see the good side of things, so just to kind of find joy and value in mundane things, I'm not being naive. It is strategic and necessary. It's how I've learned to survive through everything. I know you see yourself as a fighter. Well, I see myself as a fighter too. This is how I fight. The only thing I do know is that we have to be kind. Please be kind, especially when we don't know what's going on. Um, and one of the kind of tropes of his kindness is that he always puts these googly eyes on the laundry mat, on the laundry machines and, and the rock and stuff like that. And the googly eyes are the kind of inverse symbol of the everything bagel. So instead of just one big black hole that's empty, they are instead these two eyeballs with the black hole in it, representing a kind of yin-yang symbolism, um, and also just representing this kind of the way sincerity brings order in the form of like perception and seeing to the nihilistic background. Um, there's this really uh, like brutal, a melancholic scene where uh, in the universe where Michelle Yeoh and Raymond are very financially successful, Michelle Yeoh says to Raymond, oh, you know, but life's great. I know we didn't work out, but life's great. And, and Raymond says to her, you know, even though you've broken my heart yet again, I wanted to say that in another life, I would have really liked just doing laundry and taxes with you. Um, and that's what really kind of brings Michelle Yeoh's character back to seeing value in the life that she has in the San Francisco laundromat and the need to reconnect with her daughter. All right. Uh, so I think uh, everything everywhere all at once is a really good articulation of all these uh, aspects of metamodernism. I think metamodernism, if it follows this kind of empathetic empathetic uh, pathway and not the cancel culture pathway, really will get us out of nihilism at the societal level. And I hope that will take us off to the kind of Star Trek future where humanity is united in pursuit of meaning and purpose rather than just production and consumption. I hope this uh, little extra Friday night deep and meaningful lecture was uh, enjoyable for you guys, if not, uh, and, and stimulating, and hopefully a little bit more than that too. Um, and I guess my takeaway message is that earnestness, sincerity, kindness, and empathy are the keys to our civilization's flourishing and we should really try to maintain a generosity of spirit, particularly when we are debating values with people and trying to figure out how to live our lives well. Okay, thanks. See you guys on Monday.